Hey everybody, it's Janae, aka The Mobile Monger, here with Anna Thomas-Bates from Landmark Creamery. So Anna, tell me all about you and your business. Sure. So I am Anna Thomas-Bates. I own Landmark Creamery with my business partner and friend, Anna Landmark. And we are just starting our seventh year of production and, and doing this. We are in southern Wisconsin, just south of Madison. Um, we started off being very nomadic. We actually rent production space at Cedar Grove Cheese up in Plain, Wisconsin, a little bit um, northwest of us. We originally started with renting affinage space, and we also do almost exclusively sheet milk cheese. We do one cow milk cheese, but everything else is sheep. So that's kind of what makes us unique. Since we've started, we still rent production space, but we actually have our own affinage space now and a retail shop up front in a little town called Paoli. So that's made things a lot different and, and better. Yeah. Uh, so what did your business model look like pre-COVID? Yes. So we knew initially our whole goal was to support our families, support some local farm dairies. So we knew that we needed to be bigger than just um, selling at local farmers markets, even though that's a very robust business here in Madison and Southern Wisconsin. So we, before this all happened, and I'm gonna be looking at my statistics over here that I pulled up, <laughs> we were probably about 50% with distributors. Some of that was food service. It's hard to track how much was food service versus grocery stores, retail. Um, about 25% direct wholesale and about 25% retail through our shop and local markets. Um, and a lot of that was restaurant business here in Madison and Milwaukee. Um, since then, <laughs> we were lucky in that we had a online platform all set up because we do ship, we do mailing um, to, to direct to retail. Um, and we also, because we've done so many farmers markets, we had a lot of relationships with farmers. So we very quickly, like March 17th, we launched a home delivery program here in Madison and surrounding towns where we partner with local farmers to deliver meat, eggs, vegetables, and cheese. We gently require everyone to <laughs> buy at least one piece of cheese if we're going to deliver to your house. Um, and got that set up on March 17th. Now a lot more people are doing it, but we were, I think, lucky to get in right at the beginning. And we looked at it as something that's just mutually beneficial to everyone. We're selling cheese, which is great because as I look at my other statistics, wholesale is almost gone. Um, and we're helping out a lot of farmers who either lost, some farmers are all restaurants and a little bit of markets and lost all their restaurant business and markets are starting to come back, but they look very different and some people aren't set up to be able to handle the pre-orders and the drive-through and kind of what the health department is looking at. So we're giving some farmers an outlet for their products, we're selling our cheese, and then we're helping out people who want to stay in their houses and just have really great food and still support the local people they've been supporting for so many years. So we were able to make that pivot really quickly. So now the statistics, and this still includes January and February. So what wholesale and restaurant business are in these statistics are mostly January and February. March is almost, March and April, we've had very few wholesale orders at all, mostly because we don't do any pre-cuts. So we only sell into grocery stores that do cut and wrap. So Kowalski's, Lunds and Byerly's, um, a few in Chicago and a few here in Madison. So we just don't have the setup or the equipment to do pre-cuts, um, pre wrapped stuff. So looking at it now, the um, direct wholesale is down 100%, the distributors are down 150%, and the retail is up 600%. So it's great because we're able to pay our bills, we can pay insurance and pay our rent. Um, we did let the two part-time staff go. We kept our one part-time staffer who does affinage. And we've also stopped producing cheese right now. We're lucky that we're in a situation that we work with a local sheep dairy who has the ability to freeze milk um, and that we aren't their only customer so we can buy it when we need it. And so for now, we've, we've stopped for a while. We will probably, hopefully be able to add on a few makes soon. Um, but yeah, so it's our days look very, very different than they did before. Yeah. Um so what stands out to me is how quickly you were able to kind of pivot into that new role. Can you walk me through that thought process of like, were you guys just scrambling to be like, we need to figure something out or just? We, 
it, I, yeah, I kind of woke up that morning and um, I had been talking to two farmers who said, man, we, we've got no place to go. The big Dane County market isn't going to open up. Um, we lost our restaurants. And that just made me think, well, we're not gonna have people coming to our shop. Um, so I was trying to think what kind of delivery would make sense. And I really didn't wanna be running around town with you know half pound cuts of cheese that just seemed silly. Um, so yeah, just kind of came up with the idea really quick to partner up with local farms and it's expanded. Now we have people who actually call us. So we had a maple syrup guy call us, um, a pork producer call us. Um, it's actually the pork producer that um, takes Uplands Way. So we're selling their hog cuts. Um, and yeah, just kind of threw it together quickly. And like I said, there's a lot more folks doing it right now in Madison, but we have a lot of return customers, people who order once or twice a week. We deliver twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays. I'm cutting and wrapping way more cheese than I have in years. <laughs> so that's been kind of fun. It's kind of a Zen meditation as you mongers know, but um, not usually what I'm spending my days doing. So it's been, it's been hard. Our days look very different. And both Anna and I have kids. She has three kids and I have two and they are home. Um, trying to homeschool. So I've also been doing a lot of, you know, fraction adding and <laughs> plant phenology. I don't know. It's been, it's been crazy. So, and, yeah. and the work that I'm doing now is not stuff I can do for my house, which I could before. I did a lot more of the sales and promotion and communications before, which I could do from anywhere at any time of day, but I can't cut cheese at my kitchen table. So I have to be at our, our facility to do that. Well, that might be a, um, a good opportunity to work in some math with your kids of, <laughs> you know, the weighing out the cheeses and whatnot, but you know. It's true, except part of the challenge is, you know, we kind of look at um, what if Anna or I get sick? And so we're trying to be very careful. So actually my kids have not, usually we actually have a room in the back. So Anna's kids have been back there, just back there. They don't come up to the front to the cut and wrap room or to the shop. They just stay in this little playroom in the back. Um, and then we, I've kept my kids at home. Luckily they're a little bit older so they can stay at home for, you know, a couple hours on their own. But yeah, it's been, it's been fun. <laughs> and I just, wow. hey, did you do your math homework yet? <laughs> <laughs> so what does this look like for your affinage? Cause you said you're not making cheese right now. Um, and you guys do a nice little soft cheese. That's usually a big seller for you. Um, so what's kind of going on in that realm? Sure. So we, we did start making in February. So we made several batches, um, especially Anna Basque we were completely out of, so we needed to get a few batches of those made. So our caves are full right now with Pecor Nociola, Anna Basque. Um, the fresh cheese, we, we used to make a little fresh button called Petit Nuage. We stopped making that last year for a variety of reasons, but what we do still make is the fresh brebi, so basically the sheet milk equivalent of Chev. The beautiful thing about sheet milk is because of the high moisture and high fat, it freezes really, really well, So and it thaws beautifully, perfectly. I've actually had one distributor who prefers it frozen and thawed than just fresh. I don't know why, but... Um, so that we can still make and we just freeze it in five pound back sealed bags and then just thaw it as we need it. And that's actually been our number one seller retail wise right now is the fresh cheese, I think, because spring. And we mix up a few different flavors. Um, the biggest bummer was we had just started to launch a new cheese called Rebel Miel last year, which is a younger wash drying cheese, smaller format, which we were really doing because that's what food service was asking us for is they wanted, you know, something smaller than 10, 11 pounds. And so last year I had, we'd made a few batches. I'd started taking it to Fancy Food and ACS. Um, CMI, Sarah Munley, the winner, actually that was the cheese that she used for her, um, her bite and her, her platter. So we were getting a lot of good buzz and a lot of good feedback. And that we were kind of gonna have a big launch for that this year. And we did make two batches, but I don't know, you know, that one's gonna be hard to sell in the, you know, six to eight weeks that we need window that we have to sell it just retail wise. Um, whereas for restaurants, it was, it was flying off the shelf um, at the end of last year. So we're kind of shifting our mix a little bit, just like other people are, you know, um, and then basically right now, and we're not fortune tellers. So that's the tricky part because I know this delivery isn't going to last forever. That's going to drop off as safer at home starts to be lifted slowly, hopefully. Um, but I know there's going to be a very large gap months to a year before restaurants come back. So 
The tricky part is watching our cash flow and making sure we're being smart about that and having enough to pay down our debts and our bills, um, but still have the foresight to say, okay, in this many months, we think there's going to be some wholesale business and some restaurant business, so we should make some cheese so that we have it available. And that's been the tricky part that we're struggling to figure out. Yeah, that is, I mean, that's a very tricky part. Um, so one of the things that makes y'all so special is that you do deal in a lot of sheet milk. So can you kind of give us a little rundown of um, the hurdles that you deal with in American sheet milk cheese production? Yes. So I, we, I gave a presentation at ACS with a, uh, with some folks last year on this. And the biggest thing really is, well, it's a, it's a few things, but the, the biggest hurdle is price. Sheet milk itself is outrageously expensive compared to everything else. Um, these numbers may be a little bit different, but these are the numbers I usually give. Commodity cow milk is 15 cents a pound. It's actually probably less right now, probably quite a bit less, but normally it hovers around 15 cents a pound. When we buy milk from Uplands Cheese Company or other grass-based dairies, um, it's a little closer to 35 cents a pound. So there's a premium for that, that type of milk. Goat milk is usually 45 cents a pound and sheet milk comes in anywhere from 95 cents to $1.25 a pound. And if you think of the math of how much milk is going into a pound of cheese, in commodity cheddar, you've got about a buck 50 worth of milk in that block of cheese. If it's sheet milk, you've got nine to $10 worth of milk in that cheese. So cost of goods are way higher up front. And then downstream, you're trying to communicate why um, this cheese is so expensive and why it's worth it to consumers. Because of course, on top of all that price, we have all the other you know, economies, of, economies of scale of being a small artisan cheese maker, open vats, a lot of handwork, a lot of label, labor um, that goes into that that just makes it expensive cheese anyway. So we sell things in our shop. Um, 28 to 30 dollars a pound for finished cheese um, sometimes that's up to 35 40 dollars a pound on the coasts so it's it's expensive the one problem we don't have a lot of other domestic sheep um, deer cheese makers do have is that we actually have really good supply we started working with a few families to grow them um, when we started, kind of, we all started together, and now there's actually a larger dairy, which actually Andy Hatch mentioned during his, um, his presentation, that's nearby both of us, um, and they have the ability to produce a lot more milk, and they also have the ability to freeze milk, which is tremendous. We don't work with frozen milk, um, but at least allows them to hang on to that milk a little bit longer, and they have other customers that they can sell that to. But we, if this goes on too long, you know, we, we worry about all the farmers. Actually, one small dairy that we were working with that was marketing their milk with this larger dairy um, decided to sell their sheep. I think there were some other factors involved, but obviously this was a tipping point, which makes us really sad. Um, so yeah, we hope that we can make enough cheese that they continue to do what they're doing because they actually brought in some new genetics. So it's actually the first sheep dairy, I think, in the nation with this type of genetics. It's a soft, which is an Israeli hybrid, um, which has some advantages that we're excited to see play out in the milk and in production and in price. Thank you for all that information, because seriously, I don't think that a lot of consumers understand why American sheep milk cheese is so expensive in comparison to, say, like Spanish sheep milk cheese that you can get a Manchego, like such a, um, you know, average even at a slightly more expensive counter you're still only paying 20 bucks a pound maybe so yeah. it's a very different uh very different economy of scale there for sure mm -hmm. so has this um has a COVID affected your thoughts on cheeses that you plan to make in the future or what your lineup might look like down the road at all yeah, we, I don't think we've even gotten that far. We're kind of looking to like next week. And so just some little changes that we've made to help. We're, we're, just trying, we're trying to maximize all of these retail sales and take advantage of it as long as possible. Um, so for example, our Pecorno Chiola, we started grading it. We bought a, a grading disc and we, we package up you know, little four ounce containers of grated Pecorino because people like that. And we've sold a lot of it. Um, we have been, we made a mac and cheese blend um, with some hooked cheddar and our pipit. 
Um, so we're doing things, some added value, we're doing some more flavors of Brebby. So we're doing some more things with our cheeses that we already have made to just make them more appealing and sell as much as possible. So we can just put money in the bank and pay down debt and hopefully be able to weather out any dry period that is inevitably coming up. Um, like I said, Rebel Miel, I don't know if we'll make any more of that um, until we really know confidently that food service is coming back or we'll maybe make smaller batches, which we can do. We have that flexibility. Um, we had originally planned on started doing more Bloomy Rind cheeses, but that will be put on the back burner until, yeah, we need more time to sell stuff. Yeah. What, what I can sell in two weeks wholesale it takes me two months retail. So we have to have that longevity there. Yeah. Or do you think any of those things like the shredded cheeses, do you think that you'll probably continue those on even once, um, once kind of things even out a little bit? We'll see. We're, we're not set up to do them in any large scale. You know, we couldn't even supply a small grocery chain with enough shredded stuff and we're, we don't like to add a lot to it. So, you know, our shelf life is not as good as what you would just get, you know, Sargento from, from the store. Um, so we'll, we'll see, we'll do it as long as it makes sense. Right now it's making sense. Um, it's yeah, totally different kind of labor, but it, it's, it's making sense the bottom line right now. Yeah. I just don't think that a lot of people really understand the difficulties of doing things like that. Like that seem like, oh, well you can just shred your cheese. That's just like easy, right? So, <laughs> you know, just kind of the reality of that situation and the space that you have yeah, to do well, those sort even of packaging and pre-cuts, you know, we have a vac sealer, so we, we can make pre-cuts, but it's way different than a larger place. We don't have any gas flush or anything like that. We literally can vac seal six pieces of cheese at a time, and then we dip them into hot water, which, which shrinks it um, and pushes the air out. So, you know, what we work, we've been doing some collaborations locally, um, and so we'll do pre-cuts for people we know, you know, we've got about but literally we'll just do a few hundred at a, at a time. We just don't have the space or the cash to buy, invest in that equipment. We are lucky that we're in Wisconsin. So there are a lot of companies who are converters and that's what they do. They cut and wrap cheese, they shred it. Um, they do all those things, but they're usually for much larger customers than us. Um, sometimes we can talk one into doing, you know, a small run for us, but it's also expensive. So it's kind of not, it doesn't really make financial sense either to send it away unless we're going to really send a lot. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I mean, I obviously know that there are places that do that, but I don't really think about them because yeah. that's such a, it's like such a Wisconsin business model that like, Oh, I could just send my cheese to this place to do the cut and wrap for me. So. Yeah. I, I, I know Marika does her own. I don't know about hooks. Cedar Grove has always sent theirs away. Um, so yeah. Well, but just like Tom was talking about the cold storage, like we just, because there's so much cheese here, we do, we are lucky to have some things that other places don't, yeah. but it's not always accessible to tiny people like us. Yeah. So if somebody was starting a cheese business right now through this, um, what would your suggestions be for them? Like, what would you say should be in their business plan from the start? Like what things do you think that they should be thinking about during this? I think the biggest thing, and I tell this no matter what time period it is, is to really think about your pricing structure. Um, I would think if someone's starting now, they would have to be starting with retail and farmer's markets and direct sale, but they need to think down the line if they are going to sell, um, if they do want to sell at a wholesale price, if they do want to sell to distributors, they need to know those percentages and those markups so that they are asking right out of the gate for a true retail price of their cheese and then that they can also be able to um, take those discounts down the line. I think a lot of people start off and they start selling things at $25 a pound and then once they sell to distributors, you know, then they're trying to sell things for $10 a pound and they didn't have that all factored in. So that math is really important to do right from the get-go. Um, I also, because we don't know how times are going to 
change or how things are going to go, I would probably invest in a good web platform right away um, to make sure that you can do online sales. Because even if you're selling locally, you might be in a situation where you're doing a market where there's only pre-orders, where you're not going to be handling cash at the market, but people need to buy ahead of time and do a credit card online. So I would invest in that setup as well, which can be expensive, but if you can talk to a few people, there's a lot of ways to do it um, a lot less expensively than I think you had to in the past. Yeah. So one big kind of final last question, um, how can mongers, shop owners, distributors, uh, how can they help collaborate with you to get some of that cheese out of your caves and into the mouths of hungry people? So basically, what can we do to help you? Yeah, well, everyone's been amazing. I mean, we've always known that we had a, a great community, but, you know, it's times like this where we know it's even even better. Um, so I think just doing what you're doing, telling the stories is great. Um, I have been hesitant to reach out to a lot of the shops I was selling to before just because I know things are crazy and busy. Um, I'm probably getting to that point where I am going to start reaching out to those. So I apologize if you're not ready to hear from people yet. Um, but I do want to start getting um, at least the independent shops back a little bit since restaurants are, are gone. Um, so yeah, hopefully people will be receptive if they haven't bought from us in a while or haven't bought from us at all, trying something new. And yeah, just telling, telling those stories. That's what we're so grateful for, telling the stories and how I'm doing an amazing job of taking care of the cheese once it's in your hands. Yeah. Is there anything that you feel like we didn't touch on that you feel really needs to be said? Um, no, we talked about the challenges and the differences and yeah, just be being nice to one another and kind and patient. It's been interesting to watch. This is just kind of a funny aside. We've been waiting for like complaints to start coming in and like I also help a restaurant with with their takeout business and it's just been people have been very kind and patient and but I wonder how long that's gonna last when we they ordered three ground beef and we only gave them one we've been trying but it's people so far people are are pretty chill which is great because I think we all need a little patience and love right now and 100 percent yeah well, I appreciate you and thank you for joining me. I feel like we've packed in a lot of information in a short time and it's yeah. great because we just got the rundown of American sheep production. <laughs> and, <laughs> wow, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Janae. This has been great. It's been fun to watch everybody.